We've got a very um, high-level panel here today, um, including, of course, starting with Lisa Grandi, who is joining us from Erbil um, in Iraqi Kurdistan, um, and she is the, um, the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations um, Assistance Mission for Iraq. So she also serves as the UN Resident Coordinator and Humanitarian Coordinator for Iraq. Um, and the line has been tested, and it's up, and she's, she's with us. We've got Ranjala Adin um, in the middle here, um, who I'm going to hand over to shortly, who is going to give us a bit of a kind of security update on where we are in Iraq and what the problems are. Um, there's Julius and Thomas King over here at the end, uh, who is a technical advisor in protection and rule of law at the International Rescue Committee, the IRC. And she's done a lot of work in the Middle East in the last seven years. And Ivas Svoboda um, over here is a research fellow in humanitarian policy um, here at the ODI, um, where she's focusing on protection, access, and displacement. Before that, she worked at the ICRC. Um, I'm just going to say a few words first about Iraq, a few personal words. Um, Iraq, like Syria, is an absolute tragedy because it is a wonderful country with a wonderful, profound history and culture that goes back millennia. And I had the the good fortune of going to Babylon myself in about 2000 um, and just wandering over those reconstructed ruins there, slightly spoiled by the fact that something like every tenth brick was engraved with the word Saddam in Arabic. But moving on, um, it was still just a fascinating place to be. And I'm sure those of you who've been lucky enough to, to visit it when it was peaceful um, would hopefully share that view. It was far, a far from perfect place. You know, if you were remotely suspected of sympathies with the opposition of, of any kind of plot against Saddam, you'd had it, you know, and it was very grim. And I remember being led in 2003 by the hand around the, the Mabahath, uh, the, the Mahabharat um, chambers, the interrogation chambers in Basra by local Basrawis telling me what Saddam's people did to them. And at the time, like many people, I thought, well, you know, great, good riddance. We had no idea how badly things were going to go after that. So my personal view is that, you know, the invasion was, of course, turned out to be done on spurious purposes, but it was the mistakes that followed after that, both initially by the coalition and provisional authority, and then later by poor governance that have contributed to the terrible state that much of Iraq is in today. But I'm, we're not here really sort of too much to discuss the politics about it. This is about the humanitarian crisis in Iraq. So, um, Ranj, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, actually, just before I do that, sorry, very quickly, just on timings, we're going to have about um, 40 minutes of Q&A from the panel here um, with me asking them a few questions, and then I'm going to throw it open to the floor, and we should have about another 40 minutes of your questions and answers. So um, I'm sure you've got some good ones. Ranj. Thanks, Thanks Frank, and thanks to ODI for having me here today. Uh, I think to understand where we are today, we have to go back uh, a bit and uh, appreciate how we ended up here. Uh, so ISIS is a product of a, a number of things which have persisted uh, over the past decade. Things like good governance as, uh, or lack of good governance, as Frank uh, mentioned, uh, the inept, dysfunctional, corrupt government in Baghdad, Sunni grievances, discontent, um, <clears throat> things like uh, Maliki's alienate, alienating policies, the withdrawal of U.S. forces, and, of course, uh, the Syria conflict. Now, these things collectively uh, shape and dominate the current landscape uh, in Iraq. They've given ISIS the resources, the, the opportunity, and the conditions uh, in which to flourish. Um, and I think these are generational problems. It's going to take generations before they are resolved. Uh, nonetheless, there is some room for optimism, uh, and that's, for example, <laughs> the, the fact that ISIS... Uh, has been unable to expand. Um, uh, the fact that there, there are now widespread demands for reform, uh, as we've seen in recent months <clears throat> from the Iraqi protests. Uh, we have a more moderate, tolerated leader uh, in the form of Prime Minister Abadi, albeit a rather weak one. Um, the Iraqi army is being rebuilt, uh, rather slowly, nonetheless. Um, and we, we're seeing more engagement from the West, uh, which is a good thing, polit politically and militarily. Uh, in comparison uh, to the past few years at least, uh, but I still think more can be done in, in that respect. 
Um, as with most things in Iraq, there is a but to all this. Uh, Iraq uh, finds itself at the brink. It comes back from the brink, but then it comes back to a host of problems which need uh, more uh, immediate attention than they did before. That's things like the rise in Shia militia groups. Um, these are militias who, are, who have gone from the, uh, the, the margins of relevance uh, to playing a central role in the Iraqi state and society today. They're autonomous from the state, they challenge the state, um, and they worsen the sectarian divide between the Sunnis and the Shias. Uh, regardless of the fact that in the short term these militias were <coughs> crucial to uh, you know, saving Baghdad and stunting uh, ISIS from expanding further down south. Um, this has also led to a militarization of the Iraqi society. We all know about the militarization of the Sunni society because they've had you know, more than a decade's worth of mobilization uh, straight after 2003, then during the civil war. But what we've seen in, in uh, recent, or the past year rather, as the relevance of the state has decreased, we've seen uh, the Shia society become more and more militarized. So you can't turn a street in Najaf or Kabbalah without coming, coming across a, uh, a poster or a photo of a Shia militia head or a fighter. They've become lionized. Uh, there is an economic dimension to this as well. Uh, the militias pay between 500 to $600 per month, but without generalizing, of course, because a lot of them are volunteers. Um, they don't always get paid. There's a fiscal crisis uh, in Iraq. Uh, and of course, the most powerful of these militias are beholden to Iran. Uh, Iran's influence is now unparalleled in Iraq, much more than it was before. Um, Iran, like the Shia militias it controls, was crucial uh, to uh, uh, preventing ISIS from expanding further down south uh, last year uh, in June. But nonetheless, there may be uh, long-term costs from all that, um, given that Iran's interests and ambitions aren't necessarily uh, in the interests of, uh, uh, of, of Iraq in the long term. Uh, so in summary, I'd say what ISIS has done uh, since it emerged is reinforce existing challenges and problems, things like sectarianism, uh, things like the polarization within the Iraqi state and society. Uh, but it's also looked at as an opportunity by Iraq's political establishment. So rather than actually encouraging them to all unify and uh, get their act together, they're now looking at ISIS as a useful diversion from some of the real problems in the country, and they're trying to capitalize on that. And again, that will have some long-term consequences in the future. And, th and then maybe perhaps I can uh, later on I can discuss some of the things to watch out for, in addition, of course, to the war on ISIS. Raj, thank you very much. Um, Lisa, um, do you, I don't know if you pronounce it Lisa or Lise, but anyhow, the important thing is you can hear me. Um, would you like to give us, please, a, a, um, an update on the humanitarian situation in Iraq? Uh, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to join you from um, Iraq. Um, if you allow, we'd like to make just three or four key points about the humanitarian situation, starting off with the, the sheer scope and size of what's at stake. There are currently 10 million people in the country who right now require some form of humanitarian assistance. In a country of 34 million totally, you can see that nearly one third of the population is uh, requiring our assistance. Um, the numbers uh, work out as follows. There have been 3.2 million people which have been displaced since the rise of ISIL. In addition, however, there were still a million people who were displaced from the sectarian violence that had occurred between 2006 and 2008. The other 6 million people who are in trouble are host communities. These are families and communities who have seen their own standard of living erode dramatically because they've opened up their communities and their homes to people who have fled the violence. One million of all of the displaced are here in the Kurdistan regional government areas, and the rest are spread throughout the country. Displaced persons are currently living in more than 3,500 locations. Of all of the stakeholders who are providing aid, the majority is provided by the religious endowments, by the WAFT. And we think fully 60, even higher, maybe 65% of all assistance is coming through the WAFT and through the Zakat committees. The United Nations agencies and the frontline NGO partners are providing a lot of aid. On a monthly basis, about 2 to 2.2 million people are reached. And again, the majority of those are in easily accessible areas here in Kurdistan. The humanitarian partners are doing a much less successful job at reaching people who are in hard to access areas and very little assistance is going into areas that are controlled by ISIL and other armed groups. 
A point that was raised already is the fact that this humanitarian crisis is occurring or is coinciding at the same time as a major governance and fiscal crisis. Colleagues may be aware that the fiscal gap in Iraq as a result of the drop in the price of oil and the high cost of fighting ISIL is so extreme that the government has very surprisingly agreed to a staff monitor program by the IMF in the hope that it will receive bridging monies for that. It would only have taken that step if it felt that it had no other way of covering its fiscal gap. Because it has a fiscal gap, we already know that many of the services that are being provided by the government, they will no longer be able to provide in the months ahead. I'd like to say a few words about what the government is doing because this is a point that is often misunderstood. The government of Iraq has provided extremely large amounts of humanitarian assistance. If you're a displaced family, uh, when you're registered, you receive a million dinars right away. Every month you qualify, you are entitled to a cash grant of $380 that's given by the government. You also qualify for public food parcels. This is administered through the public distribution system. And in the governance that are administered by Baghdad, you receive free health and free education. There are, of course, problems in all of these systems. There are administrative problems, delays in registration. So although there is a system in place, a social protection floor that helps IDPs, it's not evenly applied across the country. I do also have to note that if you are an IDP in Kurdistan, your children are not allowed to go to Kurdish schools if you do not speak Kurdish. So of the one million IDPs that are here, there are many families uh, whose children are not in school for this reason. In terms of what's facing us in the months ahead, all indicators point to a dramatically worsening situation. Right now, there are 17 major con population concentrations that remain under ISIL control. That includes 10 major cities and 17 large districts. Uh, we expect that in the intensifying fight against ISIL, that we could see as many as two to three million new people displaced. At the same time, while this is going on, you have a number of areas that have been liberated from ISIL where displaced populations are either trying to return voluntarily or very worryingly are being forced to return by local authorities who are tired of hosting them. So we're very likely to see mass displacement occurring as the battle against ISIL intensifies at the same time as you're going to have IDPs who are trying to get home or who are being forced home. There are a number of things as we go forward in this year that we are extremely worried about. Um, one I've already mentioned, which is that the government is going to be able to do less and less. The second point is that the battle, the military battle against ISIL puts civilians at extreme risk. If you look at the amount of bombing that's going on, bombing is occurring in areas where there are civilians. The fighting that takes place in the military campaigns is ferocious and civilians are put at, at very high risk. Uh, one of the things that we do try and do in the humanitarian operation and protection terms is to open humanitarian corridors. This is very hard work and we're not making nearly as much progress in this area as we would hope. A third point for the humanitarians is the operation is overstretched and severely underfunded. We, in June, issued the most highly prioritized appeal ever launched in the region and although it was highly prioritized, only 40% of that has come in. Also, we have very little access into areas where the military campaign is underway, even less access into ISIL areas. Very few partners that work under those conditions and are able to reach people in need. I think we've lost, have we lost you? We, I've still, we can still go to you um, in audio, but you've gone, gone dark on us, Lise. There were just two more points that we wanted to raise. Um, we wanted to point out that a tidal wave in humanitarian terms will hit us when Mosul, when the fight for Mosul takes place. There is an expectation that of the population of 1.5 million who are there, that includes 500,000 people who have been displaced but who have fled into Mosul. We expect that as many as 1 million to 1.2 million could leave the city within hours or perhaps days. Um, just to put that into perspective, I think many of us who remember Rwanda will recall that literally half that number of people moved over a series of weeks. What we're looking at in the likely scenario for Mosul is that you would have double that number of people, perhaps, who would be moving within hours. Um, we're not even remotely ready. Sorry to interrupt, Lisa. Where would they go? To Erbil, you think? <laughs> 
Oh, I think it will vary. I think a number of them are going to run towards Syria, toward other areas that are controlled by ISIL. Um, some of them, yes, will try and get in. I think probably the majority will try and get into the KRG and also to Nineveh. Um, we've undertaken some mapping where we try and guesstimate where populations will move. Uh, we are also speaking with authorities in the region to see if we can get transit centers and other way stations established. Uh, that's something I can refer to later. That also is not going particularly well. Another major concern for us is the fact that we think that between 20 and 30 percent of all the returns that have already occurred, about 400,000 people have gone home, that of that number, 20 to 30 percent of those are forced returns. These are people who didn't want to go back but were forced to do so by local authorities. And then just a final set of observations. Um, something that's important to remember about the humanitarian operation in Iraq is that it has enormous political impact. 90 to 95 percent of all the beneficiaries are Sunnis. It is widely acknowledged here that there is no chance for national reconciliation if the humanitarian operation collapses and Sunni families and communities are left with no aid. Another point, an obvious one, is that the funding shortfall has been devastating. In May, the World Food Program cut off a million people from rations. Um, in July, 184 frontline health facilities that were assisting displaced persons had to be closed because there wasn't any money. Right now, we have a major cholera outbreak. It's affecting provinces across the country, and it is due solely to the fact that the government was unable to keep up water supply systems. A third point is that Iraq, it's an obvious one, sits at the center of a rapidly changing Middle East. We're right now in the process of preparing the annual appeal for next year. You, in appeal, have to identify what the key characteristics are of the emergency. And the number one characteristic for us is the unpredictable nature of what we're facing. With so many actors now involved in the Iraq and Syria crisis, it's very hard to know what will happen. And then finally, um, this is a point which matters very much, particularly to the donor community. Um, because the Iraq country team produced a prioritized appeal, and then that appeal was not funded, it raises very sensitive questions for other humanitarian teams around the world about whether they also prioritize. And just as a final observation, I'd like to take a minute and describe why we prioritize and what that implies, because there's an ethical gap that came with prioritization that we don't want to step away from. Of course, as colleagues are aware, when you do an appeal, you identify what the needs are, you then calculate how much it will cost for us to meet the minimum sphere standards in each cluster for those needs. In the case of Iraq, that probably would have been a four to five billion dollar appeal. It's very clear that the international community is unprepared, unwilling to provide that kind of assistance. And why is so that? So what we did was to identify, we'll come to that point in a moment, sir. So what we did was to identify an emergency package far below the minimum standard and to show how that package is sequenced across to a first line response, a second line response, and a full cluster response. And we've been very honest, very frank about the fact that the difference between the emergency package and the international standard is an ethical gap. As humanitarians, all of us have signed up to the international standard. In prioritizing, we stepped away from that. And even having stepped away, the compact between donors and between the frontline partners has been broken and the money hasn't come forward. Obviously, it raises important questions about, in the first instance, whether prioritization should take place. And in the second instance, if you prioritize, why it should be done, because there's no increase in money. Finally, in response to your important question about why the money isn't coming forward, I think there are a number of ways to answer that. One way is to point out that there's a gentlemanly understanding with the rich countries, the main donors, that it's very important to fund Syria, very important to fund Jordan, very important to fund Lebanon. There's an expectation that the funding for the operation in Iraq would come from the government and would come from the region. And in fact, in the first year, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia very generously gave $500 million to start the operation in the country. As relations between Saudi Arabia and its neighbors have shifted this past year, there is no expectation that they will generously fund this operation again. So there's an understanding with the core donors that left Iraq out. The alternative is no longer uh, feasible. It's no longer a, a credible alternative. 
Another reason that the donors didn't want to fund Iraq is because it's an oil-producing country. And, of course, credibly, the donors thought, well, as an oil-producing country, Iraq should be in a position uh, to look after its people. Those are two of the core reasons why they don't want to fund. I think there's also a residual set of reasons that have to do with a washing the hands of responsibility for a mess that was created by many of those core donors themselves. Lisa, thank you very much um, for a very thorough uh, and very depressing roundup there. Um, Julie, can I turn to you now to, to ask you what, what has been the impact of the, the growth of so-called Islamic State, ISIL, ISIS, IS, on humanitarian operations in Iraq? Um, is it possible to even deliver aid to those areas? Do they need aid? Or is it actually, as they claim, a fully functioning caliphate where life is absolutely perfect? Uh, thank you. So I think um, it's extremely difficult. I think it's already been well identified that humanitarian access is an issue. And part of the problem is that we don't have at this stage a, a, common, a common understanding of how we move forward within the framework of international humanitarian law. So how do we negotiate access? Um, IRC has been actually operating in South and Central governorates um, since 2008 and 2009. So we've had the advantage of actually doing mobile protection uh, monitoring. We have networks in place and we have mobile lawyers that are providing legal assistance. Um, and so because we were already there, because we had relationships with, with civil society actors and with community leaders, we were able to identify needs um, and to be able to provide support in hard to reach um, and insecure locations. Um, I think, you know, obviously more needs to be done um, and certainly the needs are there. Okay. Um, just to go back to my original question there, mm -hmm. I mean, in the areas, and we're, we're always told that ISIS has taken over an area roughly the size of Belgium, right. although a lot of that area is unpopulated. Um, but in the areas of Iraq where they, that are under their control, um, is the humanitarian situation better, worse, or the same as the rest of Iraq? <laughs> That's a good question, Frank. Um, I think that you know the reports that we have uh, are that, you know, approximately the same, and I don't know, maybe Rand or other panelists want to, to add to this, um, but, but certainly not worse. So those, those areas are functioning to an extent. Um, and so I think, um, but, but there's a tremendous amount of need in general. So what we're finding, for example, is that, you know, there's a huge need for, for core relief items, for food assistance. Um, so services aren't functioning um, across the board. So I think it's, it's probably about the same, but I would also encourage other panelists. Raj, do you want to comment? <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, there are often reports about uh, some of the cracks that appear in, in so-called ISIS land and its caliphate uh, in terms of its capacity to govern, to provide services. Um, and I think it's different, difficult to, uh, to gauge just how well they do, because I think we don't have as much access to information there as we do um, in, in other parts of Iraq, uh, like we do around the world. Um, so, so I think th there are grievances within the population, amongst the population under ISIS uh, control. Um, and I think those are the kind of indicators we need to look out for um, as we make that kind of judgment, uh, pursuant to your question, Frank. I'm going to turn to Eva next. Um, the, the scale of the challenge that was set out by Lisa there um, is quite daunting, and that's even if everybody actually steps up to the commitments, the financial commitments that they've made. So, um, you know, it, it's a mountain to climb. In practical terms, right down at, at street level, what, what do you think are the, what could be done to improve protection for civilians in Iraq? I think Lee started in painting a very, and Ranj as well, and, and Julia, painting the, the bleak picture. And so it's by no means easy. I mean, we're working in an environment where you have military operations, snipers, unexploded devices, um, cholera, and most recently I understand there were heavy rains and caused flooding. So it's an extremely challenging environment. Um, adding to that an area that is largely inaccessible due to the presence of Islamic State. So it's very difficult for organizations to address protection needs, but I would argue it's not entirely impossible. But before I point to some of the challenges, I'd like to make one thing clear. I mean, the main responsibility to protect civilians lies with those doing the fighting. 
whether that's the Iraqi army, whether that's other states helping the Iraqi army, militias, whether that's the Kurdish Peshmerga, um, or even Islamic State. They all have obligations to protect civilians. Having said that, humanitarian organizations obviously will have a role in addressing some of the consequences. Now, what we often found um, in, in a number of places, whether that's Iraq or, or, or Syria, is, and, and Julia um, alluded to that, is a, is a lack of common analysis. So quite often, there might be areas that are geographically separated from each other. And so organizations would work in, in one area, address the needs there, work in, and others would work in another area, but nobody would actually have the overall view. That has been changing in, in Syria and as well in, in Iraq. This might be also due to a lack of sharing of information. Uh, quite often that's a legitimate concern. You're working in an environment where you don't want sensitive information to fall into the wrong hands. But it also means that information that could enhance the analysis is also not shared. Um, another um, crucial area why it is important to have this, this analysis is it, it must underpin kind of the decision making. An analysis needs to have disaggregated information on threats, vulnerabilities, capacities, and needs to understand how affected communities react to these threats. What we found is that quite often in the absence of an international presence, affected communities self-protect. So they find coping mechanisms to protect themselves. How does that look like if there's a threat? I might decide to flee. I might decide to negotiate with a belligerent and say, can I get some kind of protection from you? Can I negotiate with you so you don't forcibly recruit my children? So there are various coping mechanisms and they need to be understood. The analysis therefore must include the perspective of affected people. And I'm afraid to say that, that quite often international organizations aren't very good at in involving um, affected communities and don't sufficiently take into account their views. Um, obviously, humanitarian organizations who want to be present work together with uh, affected communities. That in itself can have a, a protective effect, so the presence of an international organization. But I'd be very careful and very modest in making that assumption. I mean, when bombs fall, aid organizations cannot physically protect affected communities. So when there isn't access, that doesn't mean that, um, or, or let me go back. When we speak about access, we quite often associate it with access to international organizations. But in fact, local actors, and we've heard that um, before, Lise mentioned it, local organizations quite often have access because they come from the affected communities, they've been there, they've got the knowledge, they've got the language skills, they've got the networks and the connections. And so they often do the work that actually international organizations cannot do. But unfortunately, they're not sufficiently supported. And we found that quite often uh, in, in the research in, in Syria and to a lesser degree in, in Iraq, international organizations need to become better at supporting national actors, whether that's through, um, through training, but also through financial support, you know, through um, um, training on security measures. So there's an assumption that local actors are safer, but that's not, not true. They might have better access, but they're by far, you know, they're not safe. Um, so they need that kind of support. And I, and I think in many ways that can be, um, that can be proved. So just to conclude, I don't think there are any ready-made recipes for Iraq or for that matter for any conflict. It needs flexibility, it needs creativity. And as Lise mentioned, I mean, we're, we're faced with very rapid developments. So it needs a very creative and very quick thinking. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Eva. Um, I was just thinking of the uh, comparison um, in Somalia, where aid agencies were able to do business is the wrong word, but they were able to negotiate with Al-Shabaab to get aid into Al-Shabaab air controlled areas. It's not been easy, and you know it's been a stop-start, on-off uh, arrangement. But is there any similar arrangement with ISIS in ISIS-controlled areas of Iraq? I mean, we've, we we have heard of negotiations. And I, I'd like to point out that, you know, it, it shouldn't be a choice between negotiating or not. You always have to negotiate with everybody who is doing the fighting. Because they control territory, they can give you access. So it's not, should we negotiate, but how do we negotiate? Um, that requires certain skills. That requires um, building trust. That can be some, done sometimes through sheikhs, through local tribal leaders. I mean, there are ways to negotiate. I'm not saying that, 
it, it's in any way easy, and, and, and ISIS is certainly not very receptive to some of the arguments Ashabab more. We've seen examples of it with the Taliban, where you know they actually did develop a, a way of working with organizations and giving them access. So it's not impossible, but it needs um, certain skills, and it needs the support of donors, who unfortunately at times place more um, importance on counterterrorism legislation at the expense of international humanitarian law, which clearly says that you need to be able to negotiate with everyone. I've just come from the, um, the Manama Dialogue in Bahrain, um, where um, somebody asked the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, uh, would you or are you communicating with ISIS? And his reply, yep, we're communicating with ISIS with 7,700 airstrikes. That was his response. Um, please, can I turn to you? I mean, this is perhaps slightly awkward for you because you're in Kurdistan, but um, is, there, is there a risk that because the KRG, the Kurdistan regional government areas are easier and safer to operate in than the rest of Iraq. I know they're not 100% safe, but they are safer than the rest of Iraq, that more aid effort is going in there than in the rest of the country. There's absolutely no question about that. And this is, am I on? Yeah. Yes. There's no question about that. And it has created uh, an imbalance in the humanitarian operation that is of serious concern to community leaders and to the government. What you have is because KRG is easy to get to, you have the bulk of assistance through the international community provided to the areas that we can access, which are camps. Out of all the people who are displaced, only 8% are actually in camps. And yet the overwhelming majority of the aid that is coming through international partners is going into those camps where only 8% of the people are. So what you'll see in some of the camps in KRG is five-star accommodation. Then you'll go to camps in Baghdad, where populations who have most recently come from ISIL areas have made it to safety. And in those places, the conditions are as bad as you've seen anywhere. This imbalance is wholly impossible for local leaders and local political figures to manage. And we're part of it. We created this. We have another problem between a very small refugee population. There are about 250,000 Kurdish Syrians who are here. They are living in really good conditions. And the displaced who are outside of their camps and outside of the 8% of the camps I was describing earlier, I mean, are living in appalling conditions. So these kinds of imbalances which have been um, exacerbated let's be frank, created by us, are creating very serious problems that will have ramifications for national reconciliation, uh, ramifications which we are responsible for. From where you are there in K Iraqi Kurdistan, Lise, um, with the people you're talking to, both displaced and, and, and local hosting groups, is there any sense that those displaced people will eventually be able to return to their homes, their original homes? Yeah. I mean, what we're saying is that in the areas that are newly liberated, when populations have confidence that the security forces which are there are ones they can trust, they go home. So the 400,000 people that have gone home in the past several months, these are not organized returns. These are voluntary returns, except for the ones that I was describing where there's been, they've been forced. The ones that are voluntary returns are triggered when the community sees that the security forces that are there are ones they can trust. Now, if you allow me to be very frank, the security forces that they trust may not necessarily be state security forces. They may be community militia. I mean, we certainly saw this in the case of Tikrit. When Tikrit was liberated, four major Shia militia were the dominant military actors. They sat in that town for a number of months after liberation. When local police deployed, local population did not come back. It was only when Sunni popular mobilization forces came in, forces which the place communities trusted, did you suddenly see a mass influx of people into Tikrit. And this pattern that I'm describing, you see all across Iraq. When there are security forces in place that the community trusts, not necessarily the local police, but when they see those forces, that's when, when they come back. 
it, I mean, isn't that a blueprint for spreading it a bit further, wider in Iraq? I mean, Ranj referred earlier to the, the, the problem of sectarianism in, in Iraq, which is profound. And, you know, eight years of Nouri al-Maliki's yeah. misrule has led to massive problems in Iraq. If one can have more yeah. Sunni militias safeguarding Sunni areas without getting into bed, as it were, with ISIS, would that not be a, a good formula? I think that's the formula the coalition and the government are um, jointly pursuing. You just described, in a sense, the game plan for the liberation of Ramadi. Mm. So the intention there would be um, the combination of security forces which would actually liberate the town. When the IDPs would start to come back, there would have to be security forces in place. These would be Sunni fighters who, whether they were really that involved in the liberation or not, they would have to be there before you would see uh, large numbers of Ramadis returning. That, that's the pattern, and, and it fits into the security, the post-liberation security strategy that you're now seeing the Iraqi government and the coalition pursue. Thank you, Lise. Um, Julia, can I turn to you? Um, how do you see the situation as it is now? How do you see it evolving over the next three years? Um, I mean, you know, if it doesn't change, if donors don't step up what they're doing, if the conflict doesn't subside, if ISIS remains in control of the area that it's in, if government doesn't change dramatically in Baghdad, in other words, all the fairly troubling factors that Lisa's has described and that Ranch has described, if those, if those continue, what does it mean humanitarianly for the people of Iraq? So I think um, what we can anticipate is continued movement of populations, whether that's continued displacement, whether it's voluntary return, uh, or whether it's forced return. And as was mentioned by Liz, we are seeing forced return from Kirkuk, for example, to Diyala. Um, so um, I want to go back, actually, to something that Eva had mentioned, which was you know, the need to look at um, alternatives to the direct delivery of humanitarian assistance. I'm paraphrasing here, but I think, you know, recognition that um, this conflict isn't likely to end, that the situation may continue as you've sort of, as you've projected. Um, you know, as humanitarians, we need to look at alternative um, ways to deliver. Um, and I think that starts with, you know, looking at partnerships, um, civil society, but also at the at the community level. And so that's not just about transferring risk, it's about building capacity of individuals and communities to, to self-protect. So I think, um, you know, that's what we need to be doing. That's what we need to be looking at now. Ava, do you want to come in then? Look, I, th I mean, you've painted, you know, the, f the future ver very dark. And I, I, I would agree with, uh, with Julia, the conflict is not going to end tomorrow. And we see that in, in Syria as well. And, and what I fear is that, um, I, I don't know if the number is correct, but uh, Lise, you mentioned it. I think three million children are currently out of school. Three million children in Iraq, no education. You know, it, it's, a, it's a society that's been traumatized. And just going back into what the analysis needs, you know, we're speaking about displacement in 2015. You know, displacement, forced displacement has happened already during the, the government of, of uh, Saddam Hussein. I mean, we're going back years, decades of, um, of suppression, oppression, of displacement. And so this will have long-term effects. Now, you know, you can sit here and say this, this is, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be horrible. But what can the humanitarian community do? It cannot solve the problem. It cannot solve the conflict. For that, politicians, states need to make a decision and they need to find a solution and they need to find it fast. In the meantime, humanitarians can do their bit. And I think, like you said, you do it creatively and do it in a way that they build the capacity. Because what we're seeing here now is not just the immediate needs, but long term building the resilience of, of Iraqis. So, you know, ultimately, you cannot just provide the assistance. You have to give them some kind of means to um, go back to um, a life that enables them to, to provide for their families. And I think that requires also that development actors speak together with humanitarian actors. Just before I um, throw it open to the floor, Ranj, I wonder if you could just very briefly um, give us your thoughts on what chances there are that the political actors who Ava referred to there will actually get, get their dot, dot, dot together and, um, and actually come up with <laughs> 
a formula that unites Iraq, because at the moment there doesn't seem to be much sense of national unity or national identity. You're either Sunni or you're Shia or you're Kurd or you're from this tribe or that tribe. There doesn't so far seem to be a sense of national identity. I mean, if anybody disagrees, do come back at me on that. But just before you do, Ranj, if you can just say, you know, <coughs> what, what are the chances of a, of a lasting, better political settlement in Iraq? I mean, I, I don't think there's much hope uh, based on the way things stand at the moment because, as I said earlier, if we, if we look at how they reacted to ISIS, so, I mean, even in Iraqi Kurdistan, for example, which, uh, which, which has been in many ways the, the beacon of hope, uh, it's, it's been a stable, relatively stable part of Iraq, but if you look at how things have uh, evolved there since ISIS emerged, um, you've seen a, a revitalization of the conflict between the PUK and the KDP, not militarily just yet, but certainly politically. Now, if that happens in Iraqi Kurdistan, the question is what chance does uh, the rest of Iraq has with all, with all its other uh, problems? Um, the, the, there, there are a number of things which Iraq does have going for it. I think civil society is starting to play a more uh, active, prominent role. Uh, I mentioned the popular protests which have been taking place. Uh, that's put some pressure on the political establishment. Um, players like Ayatollah Sistani certainly have a, a big role to play. The question is, uh, how much of a role does he want to play uh, in all this? Um, but th there, th there are other conflicts that could potentially come from all this. That is the clash between the state and the Shia militias, uh, between the Kurds and the Shias, of course. Um, instability more generally if a body is removed and there's some kind of crisis taking place uh, in, in Baghdad. Um, and ISIS, let's not forget, I think, will emerge once again, even if it is defeated. It is a movement which uh, has found itself a very effective brand. It's capitalized on, on, on a lot of things. And even if we contain it, then defeat it, it'll disintegrate. But chances are it'll come back again, unless those uh, generational challenges that I refer to are resolved. Thanks very much. Right, um, we're going to open this up to the floor now. So if, um, if I could ask, um, if you could give your, your name and your affiliation organization, if you have one, um, and to, to please keep it to, to one question. If we have time, we'll come back to more questions. Um, and questions rather than statements, please. So I believe that the gentleman over here had a question who wanted to start with. Yeah, thank you very much for this meeting. And uh, <laughs> as far as the whole analysis we have here is... Sorry, can you say who you are? And I'm, I'm, I'm Dr. Azad Shikani. I'm just an academic. I've been involved in the humanitarian during the 19th in Iraq, in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan. And, and I've been lecturing there for 10 years about these issues. Um, <clears throat> the situation that you have depicted is, is truly, this, that's it, it's, it's dark. It's dark in on political setting and humanitarian setting as well. So the, the issue is this conflict, we all know that this will be continuing. Then uh, the issue is whether the donors' countries are still uh, able or wanting to, to spend more funds into to this continuing war, which we don't see any, any, any light in the, in the tunnel. I mean, it may continue for many years. Uh, so what to do as a humanitarian action now? So how do we spend this money now? Countries like uh, the deputy uh, uh, UN representative to Iraq say that are pulling out from the from funding. So, what to do the next is that how to deal with this humanitarian little money that you have now? Can we continue just spreading, uh, distributing food, and without having a substantial uh, a, a, an action, like uh, you said, for example, <coughs> uh, building a civil society action, that's, that's a way, one way, but it's not enough. So uh, the, the okay. point is that uh, we need to turn the humanitarian into the development action. Yeah. As, as far as uh, 
at least in those areas, that's feasible. I'm sure not in every area is the same, depending on the circumstances. But in some area, is it, it, it is feasible okay. to, to tenure. Right. And the second issue is you have to analyze the lackness of, of the re Kurdistan region, which is a five star comparing to other, other area, but still is lacking a lot of infrastructure there in order to assist the, 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 the refugees. For instance, uh, in terms of electricity, for example, uh, KRG is, is producing 3,000 kilowatt megawatt, uh, while the, the total need before arriving, the refugees were 4,500 megawatts. So can you, uh, this makes frustration among the, the, the local population as well, because okay. you take I'm, I'm, off the electricity. That doesn't make, I'm, I'm going to stop you there, because we've got a lot of questions to get through. Okay. But thank you very much for that. Lisa, do you want to briefly answer that? Is it too soon for humanitarian aid operations to turn into development? If you allow me, I'd like to come at that question from a little bit of a different angle. I think one of the things that's been very clear in the Iraq operation is that the standard sort of packages which um, many frontline partners and aid organizations provide aren't really relevant in this context. The overwhelming majority of the people who are displaced in Iraq, as is the case in Syria, are middle class families. And, you know, providing non food item kits, as you would do in a context where your majority of your displaced are peasants doesn't really make sense. And one of the things that we've been learning here is that the type of programming which we would traditionally do as humanitarians is not particularly helpful in this context. This is why we're introducing, for example, housing vouchers. You know, the majority of people are actually trying to rent accommodation. One of the problems that they face, one of the reasons that they end up having to leave Iraq, they feel they can't stay here any longer, is because they can no longer afford housing. Another form of assistance that we're introducing is on-demand shelter. This is in return areas where families come back and if their house is destroyed, they come to a kiosk where they ask either for cash or they ask for tools or ceiling kits. This is different than the kind of supply-driven humanitarian assistance which is common in most operations. Another innovation that we're introducing is the use of cash modalities. We're moving to entitlement-based cash stipends rather than in-kind assistance. Now, all of these innovations have been driven by the realization that, the, as our colleague just shared, the type of assistance that we were providing, number one, wasn't reaching enough people. It wasn't what they needed. And that's why we've moved in this new direction. Thanks very much, Lise. Right, questions? Yes. Wait, I need to say one other thing on that. Yep. This kind of programming, and this does tie in here, this kind of programming, I need to be very frank, is often extremely hard for humanitarian organizations to do. Who does it best are development organizations. And that, in a sense, uh, anticipates the question that was raised by our colleague. You know, is it development programming? Well, I don't know if you want to call it development programming, but what I can tell you is that the people who do cash stipends the best, the people that do social vouchers the best, the people who do social insurance the best, the people that do housing vouchers the best are development actors. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much for this really interesting presentation. My name is Rebecca Gang. I'm also a colleague at the International Rescue Committee. Um, we've painted a really general picture of the humanitarian struggle that, that we're seeing in the field. And Julia, I wonder if you could give us a bit more detail on you know, how this crisis is actually impacting people's lived experience day to day, um, the kinds of risk you're seeing, the kinds of harm you're seeing on the ground, who's facing that risk, are there certain types of people who are more exposed than others, and finally, has the funding shortfall, um, the severe funding shortfall, led to any particularly neglected groups or particularly neglected regions in your experience? Thank you. Okay. Um, so 
to answer the first part, which is about what are the what's the impact on people and and um, their daily lives. So I think one thing that I would highlight um, that we're seeing, you know, we talked about the nature of displacement. It's rapid. It's ongoing. Um, also protracted. So you know, 2.1 million displaced. Um, you know, even before January 2014. Um, and so one of the impacts of this is that people are lose their documentation. Um, and uh, or it's being confiscated. So again, this is a bit linked to forced return, but I won't go into that. Um, and so actually in Iraq documentation, there are four core pieces of document documentation that are, are required to access all services and assistance. So accessing health services, education, um, and so on. The food rations that, that were mentioned, um, there is a card that enables you to access those food rations. And it's uh, location based. So your card is linked to your uh, your governorate of origin. Um, and all of these systems are also paper-based. So as we see people moving um, and rapidly uh, being displaced, they are without that documentation. So it's 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 a huge it's a huge struggle to access basic services. Um, beyond that, it, it creates risks of, for uh, detention. So as people are moving either within governorates or between governorates, a lack of documentation exacerbates the risk of detention. And so IRC, our detention caseload has increased significantly, 187% for the same time period last year between January and August. Um, and it's almost 100% Sunni men, by the way. Um, and then, and then also, you know, this this impacts women um, and children because uh, because the documentation system is is patriarchal. So actually, you cannot, as a woman without a male companion, you cannot update your food ration card, which means you can't actually <laughs> access food at all. Um, so we had a case uh, where a woman, uh, her husband was kidnapped by IS and she managed to flee to Karbala. And in Karbala, she tried to, to change her PDS card and when, was unable to do so. She had to prove that her husband had been kidnapped. She had to provide documentation to demonstrate uh, that he had been kidnapped. Um, so those are some of the, the impacts. Um, and the second part of your question? <coughs> Neglected groups. So I think that, um, I guess I'll give you a bit more of a general answer. And I think if, if anyone was familiar with the whole of systems review, which was done recently, um, there was a concern that actually there, there has been a tendency in the humanitarian community to look at specialized caseloads. So within IHL, actually, there, is, uh, there, is, there are special conditions for focusing on women and children. Um, and so that's important, but um, actually at times there can be an overemphasis on specialized caseloads, which means that we're not looking, we're stepping back and analyzing the whole picture of vulnerability. So, um, you know, so there are some overlooked groups as a result of this. Um, I think we have to consider, especially in a place like Iraq, um, a sectarian identity, um, political affiliation, these sorts of things um, make people more or less vulnerable. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to take these in a bunch of three at a time, so, uh, yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my name is Joe and I'm a postgrad at UCL. Um, you're all going to hate me because I'm about to ask about statistics. Um, and it's largely to do with uh, using figures when we, you know, figures that we use with things like uh, people out of education, uh, displaced uh, populations and communities and then projections. And um, hopefully it's just going to be um, a question with a quick answer. I just wondered where you were getting your sort of statistics and demographic information from who was collecting it, particularly in, in the situation of Iraq, because you've already spoken about the humanitarian issues and the issues with access. Um, so, so how you're overcoming those issues of access to therefore get it, because obviously even a, a hundred, two hundred thousand person, you know, uh, difference is enormous, whether it's we've overestimated or underestimated. So. I just wondered the process there. Thank you. OK, next, we'll take the next question first, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, ben Dempsey from Mercy Corps. Um, just to, on the issue of, um, of cash particularly and the, and the role it plays uh, in the link between humanitarian and development program, just a shameless plug for the, within the publication on your seats is an article by my colleague Suad, who's our humanitarian director in Iraq from Mercy Corps, which, ha which addresses this specific issue, which is around trying to link up a humanitarian <laughs> cash-based response with a pre-existing government system of social protection and, and the opportunities there and about the way in which that can, uh, that can link up what, what you were describing in terms of the transitioning to the longer term. But then on, on the issue that you were asking, Frank, around the, the nature of sectarianism, 
Um, Mercy Corps has some as yet unpublished research, but it'll be coming out in the next few weeks, um, around the, the, the drivers of support for various different armed groups. And what we're, look, what we're seeing emerge is a picture where the driver is the trust and the relationship that people have with governance and with security systems. And so if they see, if, if they, if they see that improve or if they perceive that to be improving, then, then support for, for <coughs> armed groups drops, as seen by when um, Maliki stepped down. There was an overnight increase in the level of, or decrease rather, in the level of support for a variety of different armed opposition groups. And so whereby we might be sort of focusing quite understandably on the sectarianism and the issues around sectarianism, and, and that's and rightly so, but actually the, the potentially the underlying driver of the disenfranchisement that people feel and the frustration that people feel um, is, is, is in the practical relationship people have with governance rather than in the ideological relationship they have with, with the armed opposition groups. Thanks. Sorry, that wasn't a question. Well, I was just going to say... Do, do you agree with uh, my okay. question? <laughs> Discuss, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, and then, lady next to you. Yeah. Hi, Doris Carrion with Chatham House. Um, my question is for any of the speakers. To what extent does any humanitarian assistance coming from Iran? And if not, is this at all something that's discussed in the political establishment or more broadly in the country? Great. Okay, well, well, we'll do these three at a time, and we will come, come to others, I hope. Um, if, if I can sort of do this backwards, if I can come to, um, to you, um, to answer the last question, I mean, I, I'm, I'm struggling to think, if I can think of any, uh, uh, an answer to that. Is, any, is Iran providing humanitarian assistance? I would struggle with the same. I, I don't know. I, I'm not the right person, right. perhaps, to, Please? to answer that. Please, um, the government of Iran has been officially approached and asked by the United Nations to consider official development and official humanitarian assistance uh, to Iraq. Um, those discussions are uh, polite discussions, and I would even add that they are gaining traction. Uh, that does not mean that a donation has yet come through, but to be frank, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. Um, you may recall that in my um, brief set of introductory comments, I refer to the fact that more than 60% of assistance, humanitarian aid in Iraq comes through the WAFD. It comes through religious endowments. And to the degree that uh, uh, Iran and, and other regional governments are supporting religious endowments, yes, there's considerable assistance coming in. Are, are those all Shia WAFD? No. They're, they're mixed. No, they're not all Shia. Absolutely. Yes. Um, well, I can give a, an example of, of how important this was in the, the Ramadi crisis. Uh, you may be aware that when Ramadi uh, was uh, taken over by ISIL, you had within just 72 hours, you had 85,000 people that fled from the city very dramatically. They were desperately trying to get into Baghdad through a choke point through the Bisbee Bridge. Um, because the government was extremely worried about ISIL elements coming in with the influx or the outflux, uh, every person who passed the bridge had to have a sponsor. So what you saw were that the imams from mosques and leaders of the Sakat committees literally would come up to the bridge and they would say, we will sponsor 150 families, bring them across. And there was absolutely no sectarian nature to this. So you would have imams from a Shia mosque who would take you know, any Sunni families that they could bring in. And, and this is a, a small anecdote, an example of this critical role that the Sagat committees and the WAFs are playing. Thanks. Um, Ranj, I wonder if you could address uh, Ben's point there about the, the drivers towards militancy, the, you know, the fact that when, when there's hope, people are less interested in, in getting involved in militant groups. Uh, absolutely. So, I, I mean, you've got to remember that all this kicked off. I mean, sectarianism has been in Iraq for a while. So, uh, it, it, I mean, you could go all the way back to, I'd say, the 1960s, when you had the Dao Party emerge. I can go on all day about this, <laughs> but I'll make it brief. <laughs> um, the 79 revolution in Iran, um, the Iran-Iraq war, that's where it got a bit contentious. Then the 1990s era, um, when the uprising, uh, the sanctions regime, you had a brutalized population, uh, which um, was pushed closer and closer to subnational identities. But then after 2003, you had, a, you had this space emerge in which uh, you had extremists on the 
within the Sunni community, the, the mobilizers of violence, uh, of contestation against the new Iraq. And from there kind of flourished this idea that the new Iraq uh, was a Shia Iraq uh, beholden to Iran. Now, there were opportunities for that uh, to be diminished, uh, such as when you had this relative period of stability between 2008 and 10, let's say. Um, but absolutely, I think in order to diminish the role of militias, uh, of Sunni militants, you've got to take away their resources. Uh, you've got to try and uh, restrain or contain any space from emerging in which they can flourish. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon because of the proliferation of uh, Shia militia groups, um, autonomous actors, autonomous from the state. So they'll continue to shape the, uh, the perceptions uh, of their communities. Um, yes, Eva, please. No, just briefly, what, what I'd be concerned with is, is lack of accountability as well. Yes. And we've seen that after 2006, where literally, you know, the Ministry of Interior had their own detention places, mm -hmm. then that minister had his own. Um, not unlike Libya, not unlike other places, where you have complete lack of accountability. Everybody's got their own personal militia. So while I can see why people would want to be protected by militias, I think there also needs to be a reflection on who are they accountable to. And if there are violations, you know, what, is, what are going to be the consequences? You're absolutely right. And I, I, something I point out sometimes on air occasionally is that the, one of the most effective fighting forces that helped the Iraqi government retake Tikrit a few months ago um, was a militia called the Asaib Ahl al Haq. Um, and this is the same organization that kidnapped five Britons, including Peter Moore, the IT consultant, and murdered all four of his uh, bodyguards um, a few years ago. Uh, they kept them for over two years, um, and the families here were obviously devastated. Um, okay. Um, can, I, can I just add oh, one yes. more thing in that? So one word I, I, I left out was uh, the word uh, moderates. So there are moderates within the Shia community and the Sunni community, but what's lacking, surprise, surprise, is the empowerment of these groups. Um, you know, most people would agree that it's only a very small minority of uh, Iraqis that believe in the kind of ideology or the discourse that extremists on both sides propagate. But the problem is the moderates lack the resources and the support in order to, uh, to take that on. Um, Julie, I wonder if you could just address, um, I forget his name, but the postgrad, uh, yeah. his question there about the <laughs> issues of access. Sure. Um, so I'll do my best. I think you're, you're interested to know how, where are the numbers coming from? Is that right? Yeah. So, and then maybe Lise wants to add to this, but um, so uh, IOM, for example, uh, it carries out what's called the, they have a displacement tracking matrix. And so that's the sort of the metric and the indicators that are used. And they have teams that are deployed throughout um, the governorates. But then to add to that, you have other actors like IRC, for example, that have significant coverage. And so we try to coordinate um, you know, in terms of tools and that we are using to um, to contribute to, um, you know, OCHA, who then would sort of consolidate those figures. And then there are other figures as well. So then, you know, you have IDP registration with the government, obviously, um, that's not um, accurate. But so that's some indication, but I'm sure that Lise can probably um, speak better to that. Lise, do you want to address that? Uh, I Everything that, that was just said is uh, correct. Um, I would note that the government has just gone through a complete re-registration exercise for the displaced. So I think that there is an effort on their part to, to come to grips with the numbers more convincingly. I think what's very important, though, uh, in, if I may, in the question that was raised, is how do we know what's going on in areas that we don't have access to? Um, so how do we know how many people are, for example, in a besieged city like Fallujah? How do we know how many people are in Mosul? Uh, of course, we don't really know. But what we do have are extensive networks of key informants. And to the degree that we trust those key informants and that we stay in touch with them, it does give us some sense of what's happening and, and an idea of the magnitude of the number of people that uh, are likely to be impacted one way or the other. But we have to be frank. You know, this is remotely done. We're basing the information that we have on areas that are inaccessible on the key informants that we speak with. Thanks. Okay, let's take some more questions. Um, any from this side of the room? Okay, gentlemen over here. Uh, hi, I'm Tim Anderson with the Oxford Research Group. Um, 
Earlier this year, uh, Irene reported that uh, reported on um, the recent establishment of, as they described it, the most important uh, aid organization you've never heard of, which was the King Salman Center for, hum for Humanitarian Aid, um, a, a Saudi organization. I wonder if you think it's possible that um, you, this coincides with the fact that the Saudis aren't giving as much humanitarian, uh, humanitarian aid to Iraq this year. I wonder if you think it's possible that uh, places like Saudi Arabia want to centralize um, their uh, aid giving and have more control um, over where their aid goes and who it goes to. And that's why they're not giving as much um, to international aid organizations. Thanks. OK. Well, the question at the end here. Uh, Dominic McKeever, G4S Risk Consulting. Um, a common thread running through a lot of what you guys were saying was about uh, that the international community can do and support was um, the combination of training and financial support for local actors. Um, I'm just going to join this up to a more parochial point. The British, the UK government's strategic defence and security review is coming out this month, I believe. Um, and I think that a common theme to that is also going to be about so I guess exporting British expertise in both in the humanitarian front and in, in the more sort of hard security front. Um, I'm just wondering if the panel would like to sort of comment more on what <coughs> what the Brits could do better um, ahead of that SDSR coming out. As because, needless to say, we bear huge responsibility for the crisis. So, thanks. Okay, um, gentlemen. Uh, sorry, I'll come to you in a sec. Somebody at the back there. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm doing a postgrad over at um, King's. Um, it's similar to a question that we had earlier. Um, what kind of role, if any, has the UAE had um, in contributing, say, humanitarian funds or resources um, to the crisis? OK. Um, just before I turn to the, um, the panelists here, I would just say on Saudi Arabia um, and uh, the question from ORG, the from Oxford Research Group there, I mean, the Saudis are looking around the region right now and are paranoid. Um, they are, they will never forgive America and to a lesser extent Britain for tipping up the chessboard upside down in Iraq. They didn't like Saddam, but he was a Sunni ruler, and it was a Sunni-dominated government. You know, the Shia were the 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 the, uh, the junior uh, partners in that relationship, despite the fact that numerically they outnumber the Sunnis. Post 2003, it's all been tipped upside down, and the Sunnis are now finding themselves, you know, the, the weaker ones which is why ISIS found it so easy to walk into Mosul, frankly. So the Saudis are um, still deeply suspicious of the government in Baghdad. They see Iraq uh, as a proxy of Iran in many ways. They look at this whole crescent that they see as a Shia crescent, stretching from not just Tehran, but from Herat all the way to Beirut in the Mediterranean, stretching through the Alawis of Damascus, Hezbollah, and so on. And then, of course, there's Yemen with the Houthis. So they're paranoid uh, about it. Um, and that, I think, has an impact on where they want to put their money. Um, so following off on that, um, uh, Ranjai, I don't know if you want to address that. I mean, I, I don't know if you can take both the UAE and the Saudi question. I mean, and to be honest, I don't know enough about um, the, uh, the, the, the fund, the humanitarian organization or the UAE's contribution. But what I can say is that. Um, you know, you know, I think we might end up even seeing this in Iraq, you know, if it isn't happening already, maybe Lise can uh, comment more on that, uh, in that we're seeing uh, the humanitarian effort for hostage uh, to political interests. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it was David Miliband, your boss, Julia, <laughs> who uh, once said that humanitarian crises are, or political instability uh, is a multiplier of humanitarian crises. But in Iraq, I think the converse is true. And as we're seeing perhaps in the region as a whole, uh, based on uh, what, what you've said. Please. Um, on the question of UAE, the, the UAE has given humanitarian support to the KRG. Um, the Kuwait government announced a $200 million contribution. They chose not to put it through international organizations. Uh, we understand that, that probably not the entire amount, 
uh, has been spent there using, um, they're doing their own direct procurement and running the, the things that they supply through the government. Um, the UAE is also, you may be aware, the co-chair of one of the coalition's working groups on stabilization. Um, in terms of the, the Saudi question, we understand that the King Salman Center is, is meant to be a professionalization of the way in which uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia distributes assistance. I would very much associate ourselves with the observations that uh, who funds Iraq, and this would be true in other countries, of course, um, who funds has an awful lot to do with what their state interests are and how they perceive them. That's absolutely the case here. I'm very interested in Dominic's question uh, about um, with SDSR, uh, the Strategic Defense and Security Review, coming up towards the end of this month. This is supposed to take place every five years, and the last one was basically a cost-cutting exercise. This one is supposed to be a big strategic think about where Britain's priorities should be uh, around the world in terms of defense and security. Um, so, um, Julia, do you think um, Britain has something to export in terms of expertise in the humanitarian and development field? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm best placed to answer this, but I'll, I'll give it a shot and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Eva because yeah. I think you might be um, better placed. But I think, you know, one thing I would say is that, um, you know, as you'd mentioned before, it's actually the responsibility of states and other parties to a conflict uh, to protect civilians. Um, and so I would say, one thing I would say is actually integrating um, humanitarian principles and understanding of international humanitarian law into military training, um, into that kind of exercise is incredibly important. Um, so that would be something I think Britain could offer. Eva? I would be hesitant about saying exporting <laughs> um, simply because I think there's an assumption sometimes that what we know as kind of the formal system has always, you know, that's the benchmark. What we found in many places is that, you know, civil society or local actors, they have their own way of doing it. They don't need necessarily, you know, le being lectured how to do things. What they do need is tr training on certain issues. So what we found quite clearly uh, and I'm speaking now about Syria, is that quite often local NGOs would be offered a workshop on how to write a proposal. Great, but would it not be more useful for them to be, um, to have a workshop on how to manage an organization that has grown from two people in two, 2011 to 800 people in 2013? So it's about what do they need to respond to needs on the ground because they will be ultimately the ones on the ground. So I don't think it's about exporting, it's about who's best placed and what, how can we help each other do it in the best way. So it's a, it's a better balancing, I think, of expertise. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to take a question from this gentleman here and then Tana, do we have some online ones? We don't. Okay, so we'll, take, we'll stay with the room. Yes. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Ed Kens from Oxfam. I wanted to ask what could be done about uh, Lisa's pretty shocking statistic of 20 to 30 percent of people returning were not doing that out of their free, free will. Uh, I hadn't heard that figure before, Lisa, but uh, that concern is sort of very kind of, sort of front and centre of the kind of reports that I see from, from Oxfam staff in the region. I, I know that they've been talking in, in surveys to hundreds of displaced people in different areas in the last few weeks and getting a very strong mismatch between what displaced people say and what authorities say about both the security of places where they might go back to and, but also the availability of assistance. So, so I guess my question, uh, uh, it probably is primarily to Lisa, Lisa, is what can the UN do about that? Because that's an awful lot of people being forced to potentially dangerous places. And perhaps particularly, is there something that can be done in terms of the... Uh, coordination systems that the, that the UN helps to run between the UN and humanitarian agencies and the Iraqi authorities to Im improve that. Thanks. Uh, Francis Guy, Christian Aid. Kind of related slightly point, nobody's actually talked about the uh, tensions between Erbil and Baghdad at all and how this is affecting um, relief and access questions, but in particular I'd be interested to know if rations are getting through, a gov you know, the public ration system is getting through to displace people in the Kurdish region at all because it certainly <coughs> was not uh, nine months ago. Thank you. 
Okay, and one behind you. Hi, thanks very much. I wanted to come back to... So I can say who you are. Sorry, yeah, my name's Kenny. I'm working at Action Against Hunger. Um, I wanted to come back to Mosul and ask for maybe some uh, more, a more detailed uh, explanation of what can be done and what is being done in terms of contingency planning for a, a battle for Mosul, whether that's negotiation of a, a corridor, pre-positioning of aid, and things like that. And how is that limited by a reactive funding environment where we have to wait for something bad to happen before we can get money to respond? Thanks. OK. Um, the difficulty with all these questions, they're all really good, and so are the panelists. And actually, I could throw any of these questions at all of the panelists, but I'm going to have to try and pick and choose here. Um, Ranj, um, is there a discrepancy between the figures that aid organizations have and what governments give, particularly the Iraq government, but also the KRG government? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll certainly defer to I mean, my, to if my if colleagues I can put in the this panel. Even, in, in even more brutal way, sure. can we trust government figures? Um, not entirely, absolutely not, um, because, because again, of, of the theme we've discussed, that is the overlap between the political climate and the humanitarian uh, effort. Um, so I, th I think, you know, Iraq, whether it's in Kurdistan or, or elsewhere, uh, isn't renowned for its uh, uh, ability or willingness to reveal precise data or to subject itself to great scrutiny. Um, that, that's, those are my general thoughts. Liz, what can the UN do to stop forced returns of IDPs? Well, one of the points that we insist on every time that we are engaged with local actors that are doing this is we say, you're not allowed to. Under the United Nations guiding principles on displacement and reintegration, it's very clear that returns should be principled, safe, and voluntary. And it's a line that we take all the time particularly, as I said, in the places where this is occurring. We're also working with the Parliamentary Committee on Displacement to legalize those guiding principles and incorporate them into the legislative framework of the country. That would be very important because when that step is done, of course, there will be a series of administrative orders that will have to be issued by the government so that that body of legislation is upheld. Uh, we expect, in fact, that the guiding principles will become national legislation in this session of Parliament. And it's interesting because uh, this is a parliament that's very much divided between different political blocs, but this seems to be an issue that returns of populations to their homes that just about every bloc can agree on. So we, uh, we do fully expect that that legislation uh, will, in fact, pass. Um, on the question, though, and this is a more, um, and let me say, a non-humanitarian way of, of responding to this, one of the things that, that we do through the stabilization work of the UN, and that is outside of the humanitarian umbrella, but the teams within the UN that, that do stabilization activities um, spend an awful lot of time working with the security forces uh, to make sure that conditions are appropriate in the communities that people would be returning from. Now, I, I need to be frank, that is not coordinated directly with humanitarians because stabilization work is politically driven. It involves you know, very complicated uh, uh, deals with security forces, and humanitarian work is very principled. Uh, although you can see that they complement each other, we're careful to make sure that it is not directly coordinated because we don't want the humanitarian operation to be infected by these kinds of uh, very political and security-driven discussions. Thanks. Julia, on Kenny's question about Mosul preparing for this tidal wave of possible IDPs that could, could be triggered by uh, military action there, what can be done about that to, to, to mitigate that? Uh, well, I think we have to be, um, you know, we have to anticipate movement and we have to respond. Um, I think, again, you know, looking at what, what networks do we have in place at the community level to be able to respond? Uh, what partners do we have in place? Preparing now to have partners in place, building capacity there on the ground, um, you know, anticipating that we might not be able to, to provide assistance directly. Um, so I think that that level of preparation uh, is required. Okay. Um, time for one more question before we wrap up. Okay. Right at the back there, lady at the I, back. Sorry, Julia, do you want to yeah, add? I think, sorry, I think there was a question about whether or not, you're welcome, whether or not government assistance is getting through. And I can oh, yes. just briefly speak to mm -hmm. that. So, um, you know, so 
it's, it's our understanding that actually registration with MOMD, with the Ministry of Migration and Displacement, um, is, uh, it can be very challenging. So I mentioned the documentation issue previously, and actually you require <laughs> documents to even register. But the rules uh, are different in different locations, and it's quite complicated. So um, you know, we uh, understand that there are challenges with registration and also delays then in the delivery of assistance. So Lise had walked through sort of what the package of assistance was. So people are getting that assistance, um, including food assistance, but it is, it is slow um, and not an ideal situation. Thanks. Sorry, Francis. Yeah, at the back there. Hi, this is Helen from the Thompson Reuters Foundation. I'd just like to ask um, what role the domestic media is playing in reporting the humanitarian situation and what sort of impact they're having um, in terms of raising public awareness and putting pressure on the government. Thank you. I don't think I can really dodge that one. Um, it's sort of for the buck stops with me, I think, probably. Um, it depends a lot on access and information. And you know, the most dangerous, the, the, the people who are in the, often in the most need uh, are in the most dangerous places, which we can't get to. I mean, there was once a time, a long time ago, when journalists were considered to be neutral and not targets. Those days are long gone. So, you know, and it's important to remember that the people paying the biggest price in the media are the local journalists, the Iraqis, the Syrians, the Algerians, the Libyans, you know, who have just died in their dozens. Um, do it for simply doing their jobs. Um, sometimes because they're caught up in something, often because they're targeted, because people don't like what they write, or that you know that if you're either with us or you're against us, and if they write neutrally, they're considered to be the enemy. Um, so you know, and of course, let's not forget there've been hostages taken by ISIS uh, amongst journalists. Um, but there are, of course, there's information coming out of there which has got to be validated. So there is a role for that. I mean, there've been some excellent articles written by people like. Hela Jabber, um, you know, in the Sunday Times, um, Anthony Lloyd, you know, who will describe conditions in places that make people aware of it. You've only got to look at, at, um, at Bandit. I'm probably the only person in the room old enough to remember that. But in the 1980s, um, you know, Ethiopia, that the Ethiopian famine was brought to the world um, partly because um, Michael Burke went down there and, and amongst others, and had an amazing cameraman, uh, Mohammed, I forget his name, but he died in a plane crash, crash later. But they brought that alive to people's screens. And the famine didn't get any better or worse in the immediate aftermath of that. It was going on already, but if they hadn't done that, the public wouldn't have known about it, and it galvanized the whole Live Aid thing, and millions poured in, etc. cetera. Um, similar in the Balkans, in, you know, in the, the Bosnian conflict, it was journalists mm -hmm just as humanitarians risk their lives in bringing these things um, to the public. Um, so there is a huge role for it. Um, ideally, it would be better to get more. Sadly, the public, whether it's the viewers, the readers, the online browsers, have got a pretty limited attention span. I remember, you know, again, I'm old enough to remember Lebanon in the 70s, and I remember, you know, there was huge excitement in 75. The Lebanon conflict dominated. I was growing up, I was a kid then, but I remember it dominated every page of the papers, the front pages, for a long time. Well, it wasn't actually a long time. A year later, it was struggling to get on the news. The conflict was just as bad, just as many people were dying. The humanitarian tragedy was getting worse, but the public were bored of it. The public has a very limited attention span, and that's, that's the challenge for you humanitarians, is is trying to keep not just the public, but politicians engaged in a tragedy which is getting worse in both countries, Syria and Iraq. And we do have a, a role to play. Editors will only sadly put something on if they think there is something new, because we are in the news business, and it's got to be something new. So a new report coming out is a good peg to put it out. You know, new access to somewhere, a terrible new statistic. It's awful you know, that it should take that, but that's the reality of it. Otherwise, the public aren't interested, or not interested enough, as much as they should be. So I'm going to. Um, Sorry, were you yes. asking about local media or? Yeah, domestic media. As in, in the UK or? In the UK or over there. Over there. Oh, sorry, I've gone and given you completely the wrong answer then. <laughs> I, I can answer that briefly. Please. I, I think. Uh, I mean, <coughs> th th there is a. They are playing a big role in raising awareness. They're very keen to showcase their efforts. That is from a from a governmental. Uh, 
uh, uh, angle, uh, but also civil society are often on the media. There are numerous uh, fundraising campaigns going on all the time. The media are quick to highlight all that. I mean, it's a battle for resources, uh, for international recognition, but also uh, a genuine uh, effort to raise awareness. So to answer your question, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm just, just before I ask each of the four panelists to give a one-sentence wrap-up, if they could change one thing. I'm going to give you a bit of time to think of this. Um, if you had, in one sentence, what realistically would you like to change? And by, by that, I mean, you know, don't say an end of war tomorrow, because you all know that's not going to happen. But what, what feasibly would you like to see done in one sentence? So before, um, before you all answer that, um, just as a few things. The, um, the video of this will go online um, in a few days' time. It will be accessible. Um, the humanitarian exchange is available on the HPN website, and that's www.odihpn.org. That's H for hotel, P for papa, N for November, dot org. Um, I think some of the panelists, or all of them, are going to stay around for a few refreshments. Everyone's welcome to stay afterwards um, in the lounge outside the room. Um, so, Lise, let's um, start with you. Your one sentence, your panacea for the troubles of the region. Well, as a humanitarian coordinator for Iraq, rather than have the international community give $400 million to the humanitarian effort in Iraq, they would give four times that. They would give $1.6 $1 billion. And that would mean that a whole lot of people in the country would have options for staying there. Thank you. Julian? <clears throat> uh, so I would say that rather than continuing to focus on the direct delivery of assistance, uh, we need to look at community capacity, individual capacity, and start building resilience and self-protection capacities there um, in recognition that crisis is ongoing and the situation is protracted. Uh, so for me, it would have to be greater Western engagement, because I think it's questionable uh, that ISIS would have emerged and, and, and would do what it is doing today if we had seen greater Western engagement with Iraq in the region over the past few years, because the sad reality is Iraq did fall off the radar for quite some time, but now it's back on there. So greater Western engagement. Thanks, man. I'd like to see better compliance with international humanitarian law by all belligerents. Um, it's not going to stop the war, uh, and certainly there will be violations, but if there was a, there were less violations against civilians, that would already improve the situation. Okay, thanks. Well, a big thanks to all the panelists, to Lisa Grandi in Erbil. Thanks so much for making the time coming up uh, in a perfect line there. Um, to, to Julia from I ILC, to Ranj, um, and to Eva Svoboda here. And thank you to also for all your questions and for, for being here today. Thanks very much. Thank you.